thank you everyone for coming to Students with a Purpose uh, last meeting for the 2020 school year. Um, for those that don't know me, I see a lot of new faces out there. My name is Spencer, I'm the president of SWAP. And uh, before I go ahead and turn the mic over to Rachel, uh, our treasurer for this evening, um, I just wanted to go over some of the protocol for the evening. Um, so uh, for the speaker, while uh, whoever is speaking, if everyone could have their mic muted, um, just because trying to talk over everyone's background noise is really, really hard. Um, and then any direct questions uh, or, or comments that we would like to ask our speaker, um, just go ahead and throw them into the comment or, or the chat section. And uh, I will go ahead and ask those questions at the end of everything. So without further ado, Rachel, go ahead and have the mic. Thank you. So tonight we are joined by Diane and Kelsey from Florida. And so back in 2014, they started a nonprofit called Dollars for Ticks. And so what this nonprofit does is they award um, scholarships to college students with Tourette syndrome. So I think first they just started with undergraduate and then gradually they've been adding more and more every year. And I think you guys have done um, graduate de degree scholarships now too. Okay, yeah, so, so it's super cool. Um, and I have a personal relationship with this nonprofit because I actually was um, awarded one of these scholarships my freshman year. Um, and so Diane has prepared a presentation for us tonight to talk about starting nonprofit and running nonprofit and what that kind of entails. Um, so thank you so much for being here with us tonight, Kelsey and Diane. Absolutely. We are so happy to be here and it was wonderful to hear from Rachel with this invitation. So thank you all. I, I just admire your organization, Students with a Purpose. That's awesome. I'd love to learn more about it. But uh, here I am in sunny South Florida. Couldn't be much further from Washington across the state, but have visited your area. Uh, we have relatives in Oregon, so we have been there, but uh, it's great to talk to you on Pacific time zone and, and to be here. Um, as Rachel mentioned, we started our organization in 2014. Professionally, I'm a public relations writer and practitioner, so that's what I do here in Florida. What we're going to do tonight is I'm going to turn it over to Kelsey in a second. She's going to introduce herself, and then we're going to start with just a few slides to tell you about our organization. Then we'll take a little break, and I'll come in and talk to you for a second, and then I'll start on the 11 hats of nonprofit management. Does that sound okay? All right. So I'm gonna start by um, letting Kelsey talk for a minute and then I'll share my screen and we'll get some slides going. Go ahead, hon. There we go. All right, hi, I'm Kelsey. Um, I'm Diane's daughter and um, currently, well, actually currently I'm in Boca Raton with my mom, but I reside in St. Petersburg, Florida where I teach third grade um, I'm in elementary school, so I'm a teacher. And um, I'm just so excited to be able to present tonight. And um, I'm actually the vice president of Dollars for Tick Scholars. And we started this organization back when I was in college and we were looking for scholarships um, for Tourette Syndrome, which I have as well. Um, so that's kind of where this got started. So um, I'm gonna start by just giving a little background on us and then my mom will kick off into the 11 hats of nonprofit. Can you see the screen? Yeah, but it's yeah. not, it's not full. Okay. There you go. There, yeah. All okay. right, so we are the Kelsey B. Diamantis TS Scholarship Family Foundation, Inc. Um, our DBA is Dollars for Tick Scholars because the Kelsey B. Diamantis TS Scholarship is a long name, it's a mouthful. Um, and down below, you can see our website there if anybody's interested to go check us out um, later afterwards. All right, so 
every good nonprofit has a mission statement and ours is to encourage students with Tourette syndrome to attend college and to stay in college through awarding college scholarships as an investment in their future contributions to society. So our fun tagline we made up was college scholarships for movers and shakers. Um, our secondary mission, you can see that's me there, is to sponsor two children per year to attend Tourette Syndrome Summer Camp. Um, that picture was taken of me about three years ago, and I volunteered at um, one Tourette Syndrome Summer Camp called Camp Twitch and Shout, and we have supported them for a few years, and now we've moved on to another uh, Tourette Syndrome Summer Camp um, called Brainy Camps. All right, so first and foremost, what is Tourette syndrome? This is always the big question. Um, Tourette syndrome is made of two different parts and they have you have to have both of these to be classified as having Tourette syndrome. So the first part is motor tics. So facial twitching, eye blinking, body movements, anything with the body, and then vocal tics, coughing, whooping, throat clearing, noises with the voice. Um, some facts about Tourette syndrome, there actually is no cure. Um, there are medications and things and different programs to help alleviate it, but there is actually no cure for it. Um, sometimes this is inherited. In my case, I have a pretty mild case, but um, nobody else in my family has it. So that was just a fun little uh, thing that I got. <laughs> um, another fact is that boys are actually affected three to five times more than girls are. Um, coprolalia is probably the most widely known form of Tourette syndrome. That's what you're going to see on, you know, YouTube or TV, the, the cursing and yelling and screaming tics, um, but actually only 10 to 15 percent of people who have Tourette syndrome have that coprolalia, so it's not everybody. And then one out of every hundred kids aged six to seven in the United States are diagnosed with Tourette syndrome. So why scholarships for Tourette syndrome students? Well, not only do they have to go to college and pay for their tuition and all these other things, but there are other costs beyond just schooling. Um, for example, in high school, they might have tutoring. You might have to pay for medications, class retakes. I know when I was in college, I had to take, um, I think it was I don't know, algebra like a few times um, because it was just really, really hard for me. Um, there are also special needs like private rooms, weighted blankets, and then also psych ed testing. All right, here are some accomplishments that we have done so far through the 2019 year. We have awarded 27 undergraduate scholarships. Uh, we just awarded our graduate student scholarship, so 28 total. We have a partnership with a vocational tech institution. We've given out 10 camp sponsorships. Um, we've awarded a little over $34,000 from all of our scholarships combined. And on top of that, we're an all volunteer organization. And then some other fun facts about us. So um, these are a few recognitions that we've had this past year. We actually were a recipient in 2019 for the Rising Star Award, and that's an international award um, with .org Impact. And we actually won $5,000 from that. So that was really something awesome that we were able to receive. Um, and then we were also a finalist in the Community Inclusions Award. All right, here's a little picture of all of the students who have received scholarships from us. You can see in 2015, we started with only three kids and we moved to giving out five scholarships and so on and so forth. And if you can see Rachel is in there, right there. <laughs> All right, now this is our first um, grad scholarship for the 2020 year. Um, this is David, and he is going to school in the New York University Tisch School of the Arts. And he wants to become uh, like a programmer, a gamer for young kids, for kids um, to just develop things that will help society for the greater good. So he's our first grad scholarship. And then here's a quick little video we'll share of one of our other scholarship recipients, Jason, and he's just going to say a few words about D4TS. Hey, my name is Jason Ingrick. Uh, 
I'm a chemistry major at Northeastern University. Um, my first year with college as a, as a student with Tourette's, it's been challenging. Uh, the ticks definitely take away from my uh, test time, but the university has good accommodations and the professors are really understanding. So uh, I've been able to pull through uh, and make the Dean's List my first semester. Uh, yeah, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of ways where uh, the university helps. They give you the accommodations for extend time and uh, and separate setting testing, and they really make sure that that you're putting your uh, your best work on your tests. Uh, so you know, I just want to thank the uh, the Dollars for Tick Scholars uh, for giving me the chance to you know come to school and have a a few less problems to worry about while I'm here. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to my mom. Thank you, Kels. So that's just a little bit about our organization so you have a background of where we started and where we came from. I wanted to ask of you all, how many of you hope that when you're finished with school that you'll end up working in a nonprofit organization by a show of hands? Anybody thought that far? Okay, a few of you. And how many of you think that for that nonprofit organization, you'd actually like to start one yourself? Okay, we have some uh, people that are looking forward to doing that. So thank you for that feedback. Did you know that there are about 32,000 nonprofit organizations in the state of Washington? I looked that up. So that's quite a few. And then I looked up Florida after that, and there are about 69,300, at least currently. So a lot of competition for our dollars, but a lot of people out there doing good. So that's always a good thing. All right, I'm gonna share my screen again, and we're gonna get started talking about the 11 hats of nonprofit management. Here we go. All right, so when you begin a nonprofit Obviously, especially when you first begin, you're going to be wearing many hats as you begin to think about how a nonprofit organization is going to work. And even if you work for one, you may be wearing many hats. So let's go through a few of these that I came up with to share with you and looking forward to taking questions at the end. First off is mission management. When you start an organization, obviously you're going to have a mission statement. And it's very important that you're very clear on what your mission is and what your mission isn't. You need to be mission centric. You need to think about who you're going to serve. In our case, it's children for camp, students for scholarships and adults because we've partnered with a vocational technical organization to award, to award scholarships in PC career training. So think about who you're going to serve and actually what, you're going, what programs you're going to have. We are very specific. We award scholarships. We're looking to start a renewable scholarship program to really help a student financially. We do summer camp sponsorships and then the vocational technical scholarship I mentioned. It's very interesting as you start your own nonprofit, how many people come to you and say, why don't you do this? Why don't you advocate in the schools? Why don't you go speak to people? Why don't you do research? Well, there's a National Tourette Association in our case, and they do education, support, and research, which means we don't need to do that because they do. And what they don't do are scholarships. So by identifying the one thing that there's a need out there for, you become mission centric. And in addition, you have to look at the resources you have. We're an all volunteer organization, fairly small. We have volunteers when we need them, but if we did everything everyone suggested, we would uh, be very unfocused. So when you think about starting your nonprofit, again, to your mission, research what other organizations are out there that might be doing something very much like your idea. Maybe there's already an organization that's doing that and you can either join and work with that organization and perhaps help expand their model and their mission, or you can work for them and just learn more about what they do and realize that yes, there's still a need, but always, always when you're thinking of your mission, make sure there's a niche that has not been filled before you embark because believe me, there's a lot of time and a lot of expense to starting your own nonprofit. So be mission centric. Next is formation management. I have two slides with this because there are a lot of steps to forming a nonprofit and I'm not sure how much your group has gone into researching all of this. 
the first thing you want to do is become a corporation, just like any business. When we filed our articles of incorporation, which is the next thing there, there's a way to file them in Florida where you're listed as a nonprofit organization, not just any corporation. And I actually did it wrong the first time and had to go back and do an amendment to make sure that we were listed as a nonprofit. So we did that. Also with your nonprofit, you're going to have bylaws. This is a set of documents for guidance on how you'll run the organization, such as how often will you have board meetings? And what are the uh, penalties for someone not attending a board meeting? And all kinds of rules about the organization that you're gonna put in writing, and these are required in order to form your nonprofit. Next, right here, we have the 1023 form. This is actually a form from the IRS this is the one you fill out to gain tax exempt status. You may be aware of that. In our case, it, it was kind of interesting. We were filling this out after Kelsey graduated from college. It was about a 23, no, 28 page form. I had help from my CPA to fill out this form. It was quite rigorous. It makes you think about your mission and what you're going to try to accomplish. And then lo and behold, right before we submitted our 1023, the IRS came out with the 1023 EZ form, which is about three pages. And we look at split, finish that, turn it in, and we had our answer in about three weeks. So that was amazing. But that's, that's a necessity if you want to gain tax exemption. They mail you what's called a determination letter that you can use to say that you are tax exempt. From that point, you need to apply with your state for tax exempt certification, which is a different process because you go through whatever uh, agency of your state offers that certificate. And when you get that certificate, in our case, it's good for five years. And that's what you can take to your retailers, Office Max, Party City, wherever you're gonna have an event, you take that certificate so that you're not charged sales tax. Next is the 990. This is like your personal tax return, but it's for nonprofits. When you fill out the 990, it tells all kinds of information about the organization, your assets and so forth, and your expenditures. But a good thing about the 990, at least if you're someone who's looking to a, another foundation for funding is, it lists who you gave money to and how much money you gave. So it's a great way to research funders for your nonprofit. Fictitious name, in our case, as Kelsey said, our name was way too long, so we decided to use Dollars for Tick Scholars for our fictitious name. This is something you apply for in Florida. It's good for five years. It costs $50 to do that. You have to place an ad in the paper. So that's part of our formation. Next, with every business, you're going to want to have a business plan. We actually kept it very simple, and we used a document called the One Page Nonprofit Business Plan, and it really works well for us. But just like any business, you're going to want to know what your goals are, what your resources are, what your finances are, and your plan. So have that strong business plan so you know that you've really planned well. Also, we recommend a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats because I would do this when I first started my organization and then we review it annually to see what's out there that might be threatening our status as a nonprofit or how we can grow and what we can build on as far as our strengths. Also be ready to renew your annual report every year and that's just part of keeping your nonprofit legal and, and accurate. Next, let's talk about legal management. This may be something that, that you're aware of or you're not aware of. I really wasn't. Um, before we started d for ts I had never run a nonprofit. So this is something we learned and it's solicitation registration. You need to be registered with your state attorney's general's office to solicit uh, donations. So you'll register through your state, through whatever agency it is. Actually in Florida, it's the agricultural department, interestingly enough. So you register in your state and you become legal to solicit. Then if you decide you're going to be beyond the state of Washington, for instance, you're going to want to register in any state where you're going to be soliciting. You can either do this yourself or you can hire it out. There are companies that will do it for you, trust me, for several thousand dollars, but it is a lot of work. We actually do it ourselves for as many states as we possibly can. And it involves filling out documentation from your profit and loss statement, usually by May 15th of the following year. So for instance, we had some due this past June, Kelsey and I just finished filling them out for 2019 a couple of days ago. So that's something you monitor throughout the year. What constitutes solicitation? This is a bit of a gray area. Some people might ask, is just having a website out there solicitation because you're there? But in our mind, solicitation means that you're ask, actually asking for money in those states. So for instance, if you have an email subscriber list for your nonprofit, 
you're going to want to know what states those people who are on your list are from so that if you're sending out an email letter telling about donations or a campaign that you're having, you know that you're approaching the states where you're registered. So this is a big deal uh, legally, so you wanna keep yourself on the up and up. Our next hat is board management. Rachel mentioned that you had someone in talking about what it's like to be on a board, I believe. So I just had a few tips about that that I wanted to share. When you form a nonprofit, you're going to want to make sure you meet the minimum requirements for your state of forming a nonprofit. And I looked up Washington, you need one board member at least to form the nonprofit, but you need at least three to apply for tax exempt status. And that's what we had to have in Florida was three board members, so we've done that. For your board, determine the strengths and weaknesses of the people that you invite to be on the board. Do you have someone that's great in finances? Do you have someone that's great in communications? So try to build your board with people with complementary strengths to make your organization as strong as possible. Also with your board, identify your control tolerance. For instance, if this is an organization that you've formed that's near and dear to your heart, when you bring in more and more people, there's advantages because they have contacts and ideas, but you also have to identify, are you comfortable with having all those ideas and will you lose control because the, all these ideas surround you? How much do you wanna control what happens? So just be aware of that. It's a great idea to create board guidelines. You can see this document that I put on the slide. When we invite a new member, to our board, we provide these guidelines and it outlines for them what they can expect, how often the meetings are, things that they might be able to participate in to help us, and also how often, what are the requirements for them attending meetings, and if there's any financial obligation. So it's a great idea. It even on the third page has a place for them to sign that they're actually committing to those requirements. So it's great and it makes everything clear. Keep your board members engaged by making sure that if you assign projects and you're all working together, that they understand the big picture and how that's benefiting your nonprofit overall, and in our case, our students, to make sure they're engaged and involved. Most people require that for a board, you should require a financial commitment. We do that with Dollars for Tick Scholars. We require a monthly commitment. I believe you've probably heard the saying that if you don't pay for something, you don't value it as much. That's part of it but also it really helps knowing that these funds are coming in regularly so you can help plan different things with your organization. Require meeting attendance, be very clear on what's going to happen if people aren't able to attend multiple times because you really need their involvement and support so you can all make decisions together. And as I said before, it's a great idea once a year, we do it every June, to evaluate your business plan, do your SWOT analysis, and you want everybody there for that meeting so you can be on board and get all the ideas. Our next hat is volunteer management. Just like you're needing to know how to manage a board and run it well, volunteers are very important to the life of an organization. Here's Georgina. She was a uh, college senior at Florida Atlantic University majoring in international business and she came and volunteered with us for the last six months. Unfortunately, COVID-19 kept her at home so she's not able to come anymore. One place we have found, I would say almost all of our volunteers, is the website volunteermatch.org. And the good thing about that site is that it also posts the volunteer opportunities on LinkedIn. So we've had people see us on LinkedIn. You're able to describe the position that you have there and it's been invaluable for us. One thing I would advise for volunteers is when you speak to them, find out what their goals are. It's not just about you. It's not just about what you need done, it's about or I always like to think, what do you want to get out of this volunteer role? Are you looking to increase your speaking to people skills, your communication? Are you looking to learn certain software? And talk to the volunteer about what they want to get out of it so that you can really match up and, and know that it's a good relationship. Find out what their skill set is and what they can offer you. And again, what they'd like to improve. Inspire them. Once again, they may be doing a little bit of data entry, but they need to know how that impacts the entire mission and how they're really helping the nonprofit move forward. Communicate your expectations with them. Make sure you know when they should arrive and when they should leave and uh, what you're expecting from them so that they're reliable. Because for instance, in our case, we invite them into the office and I've set aside that time. And if they don't show up, then that's not uh, helping me any. Um, tracking. This is something you may not have thought of, and that's tracking the number of hours that a volunteer participates with every year. When you're applying for grants, occasionally funders will ask, how many volunteer hours do you have? And so I always have them fill out a sheet 
when they arrived, when they leave, and what they did while they were there. So it's important to track their time. Reliability, that goes without saying. Background check would be up to every organization, and I'm sure uh, everyone does that a little differently. We've only had one case where I wish I had done a background check. There are uh, inexpensive organizations that can do that for you, but it might depend on how large your organization gets, whether or not you do that. So we typically speak to someone on the phone first and then try to meet them in person and do a little bit of an interview and see if they're a good fit. Our categories of volunteers are for searching for grants, for events, we have registration and auction salespeople and booth manning, all kinds of people for events. We have a volunteer selection committee for our scholarships. And like Georgina, we have people come into the office. So a pretty good uh, volunteer band that we have. Our next hat is donor management. Stewarding your donors. You need to be very friendly in your communications. We try to do that in our emails, come across very friendly and personable. And also it's important when you're speaking to your donors to find out what's important to them and let them know what's in it for them, that they can actually transform a life of a student. So try to communicate that as much as you can. We hold events for awareness and perhaps extend a personal invitation to some donors to make sure they're going to be there with us. Um, and it's also important to provide donors with ideas on how to help. We actually came up with a flyer that says how you can help and it lists the various things. Someone might want to have an event for you or they might want to spread uh, the news on social media about what you're doing. So they appreciate it when you tell them how they can help because people do want to help. It's also very important to us to provide donation receipts within 48 hours of when someone makes a donation and makes them feel appreciated and though you're recognizing their support. And we always send thank you letters with our donations. So make sure to be personal with your donors and let them know how they can help and how much they're appreciated. Communication management. Now, Rachel mentioned that I'm in public relations and it's really come in to be very handy promoting this nonprofit and uh, getting it out there. We have several ways of communications. We have social media that we do. I always say it's important to find out the social media platforms that your constituency is on. Are they on Instagram? I noticed that you all posted the meeting on Instagram tonight. Are they on Facebook? Um, we use Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and we do have a LinkedIn page as well. So we put out social media about our events, and we also notify our scholars when it's time to apply or when the applications are open and things like that, and any articles we run across. Also, communications is to your email subscribers. We have a place on our website where you can click and you can subscribe to our emails and get on our list. So it's very important that we continually email our subscribers, let them know what's going on, and um, like I mentioned, that's a list where we can tell what states people are from and so forth. Public relations. You can see a couple of articles that I've put on the slide here where we were featured in the paper and in a magazine. It's always true with public relations that there has to be news. Uh, we do press releases, but there has to be news, such as we just award our, our scholarship winners or we're having an event. So the media wants to hear from nonprofits. They want to report on people doing good. So it's, it's a fun thing to form relationships with them and use public relations skills to get some, uh, some press for the organization. Blogs, some of you may enjoy writing. We have a blog on our website. Something we like to do is invite guest blogs. We've had people write blogs about CBIT, which is a Tourette syndrome treatment. We've had uh, a doctor write about, should you talk about your disability in your college essay? So we invite guest blogs, and then when I have time, I write them as well about what things are going on. And when we write a blog, we can then put the link in social media or in our email letter so that more people can get exposure to the blog. Of course, we have our website that tells just about everything you want to know. We do have a YouTube channel with some videos. Google AdWords Express or Google AdWords. I wonder if you knew that when you register with Google, Nonprofits who are registered can get $329 a day of free Google AdWords. And so that comes in handy when we have an event, we'll put terms like, uh, you know, what's for dinner tonight? Say we have an event at a restaurant. So that comes to 10,000 free AdWord dollars per month. So that's a great thing to do for nonprofits and it's free. And also with all of your communications, branding consistency. 
the color teal is actually the color for the National Tourette Association, so we associate it with the color of Tourette syndrome. Our other color is maroon, which I like to call garnet because that's actually Kelsey's birthday month is January. So our colors are maroon and teal, and we always try to use similar fonts in all of our communications, and our logo uh, is consistent pretty much wherever we use it. I wanted to share a few software ideas of software you might want to use in your nonprofit. Perhaps you're familiar with Canva. If you're not, it's really, really fun. This is a design, I see some heads nodding. We use it for a lot of our social media posts, so I'm glad you're on to that one. It's a lot of fun and very helpful. Trello is a project management software, and we use that for campaigns because you can make columns by the date something's due and then drag the card over to the next column. So we love Trello, it really helps us stay on target. Buffer is a social media posting platform where you can schedule your, your posts ahead of time. So when we're doing a campaign for an event, we can post those and just relax and know that they're gonna come out. Obviously the Microsoft Office uh, Suite, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, Publisher, and then Access is a database that we use to track our donors and also our student records. We use Google Alerts where we're alerted about news about Tourette syndrome in case it's an article that we might wanna post on our Facebook page. Grant Hub is our grant tracking software. We invested in that this year and it's fantastic. It's, it's much like the idea of an Excel document, but it helps us track the funder themselves and our communications with them when things are due, what format. So that's put out by an organization called Foundant and we really love Grant Hub. Of course, we use QuickBooks for our books. Aweber is our email software, much similar to Constant Contact, which I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, Bitly is a link shortening software that we use in case you have a very long link uh, for an event and it's easier to put something short. And then this last one, answerthepublic.com is something I recently learned about. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's wonderful for blogging. You can go to this website and you can find out what people are searching for online. So for instance, if you have a company and you have a blog and you have frequently asked questions, you can put in what are people searching for, like I did Tourette syndrome, and it comes up with this graphic that looks like a spider really and all of the questions that people are asking when they're googling online when they ask all the questions that people ask so try that out i think you'll find it's interesting for blogs and maybe other uses as well it's great our next hat is fundraising management when kelsey and i first started in 2014 we had the idea that the way to kick off a nonprofit was through a crowdfunding campaign have you guys heard of crowdfunding such as Kickstarter, Indiegogo, even GoFundMe, you may have, but this, these are uh, software platforms where people can uh, kick things off and ask for funding. So I would love to play for you the video that we did for our Indiegogo campaign, and I'm sure you'll get a kick out of it. Here we go. Whoops, let me see if I can go back. Okay. Have you ever looked for something that you just couldn't find? You thought maybe you were looking in all of the wrong places because it just had to exist, but it didn't. My name is Kelsey Diamantis. I just graduated from college in 2014 and now I teach fourth grade. I have Tourette syndrome. When I was diagnosed at age 11, I didn't know many people who had Tourette syndrome when I was growing up. I live in South Florida, the place where people dream of vacationing. I live every day. When it was time for me to go to college, I knew it was going to be tough. High school was very challenging for me. With Tourette syndrome, I was a distracted student. Knowing that a tick might come along at any moment kept me from focusing. I'm so glad I had the support of my family when it was time to go to college, but it would have been nice if we had found a college scholarship to help with a financial burden. I'm Diane Diamantis, and I'm Kelsey's mom. I am so proud of all that she has accomplished. The surprising thing was that when she started school, we could not find any college scholarships for students with Tourette syndrome. Both of us searched all over the internet, and I ran across forums where other moms were also wondering 
where can we find a scholarship for our child with Tourette's? It was probably Kelsey's sophomore year when she was in college in Florida, and I wrote her and said, let's do this ourselves. Let's create a foundation to award college scholarships to students with Tourette's to encourage them that they can go to college regardless of their tics and to help them to stay in college and then go out and make a contribution to society. Just like Kelsey is doing by teaching fourth grade. Together, we established the Kelsey B. Diamantis Foundation, or the shorter, easier name, Dollars for Tick Scholars. Kids who have Tourette's can do so much in the world to really make a difference. So I like to say that we provide college scholarships for movers and shakers. <laughs> Students with Tourette's syndrome have enough to worry about. Ticking, embarrassing themselves, social acceptance without having to worry about college costs. Our scholarships will financially support students with Tourette syndrome, from incoming college freshmen to incoming college seniors. We need your help to raise money for scholarships for 2015 and beyond. Our candidates for the Tourette syndrome scholarship will be so thankful for your donation. They've been looking <laughs> for scholarships that encourage them and recognize their potential. Do you know someone like me who is affected by Tourette's? With your help, a student with Tourette's syndrome will know that you believe in him or her. Please donate what you can to help, whether it is part or all of a scholarship. We want to help scholars with Tourette's syndrome focus on school, not college costs. Thank you for listening and for your generous support of our campaign. So there was our crowdfunding video, and I hope you enjoyed that. I'll always be thankful to my friend Cassie, who had a green screen in her house, a teleprompter, and a husband with a camera. And then we took all of those parts, and have you ever heard of Fiverr? It's a, it's a, soft, it's a uh, website, and they have a lot of uh, graphic people and all kinds of services. So we went to Fiverr, and someone put it together for us in video form with all the background pictures that we supplied. So we had that video on our crowdfunding campaign page, and then we had our first event in November, and we had it in the bank lobby. We had 65 people there for our first event, and it was just a great way to kick it off. So that was our very first event. Speaking of events, when you have an event, make sure you know what's your why. Make sure you are saying to yourself, am I doing this event to spread awareness? Am I doing this event to raise money, which is often the case? Am I doing this event to gain corporate sponsors for the future? So find out to, to tailor what's your why will determine what kind of an event you have. At D4TS, we take pride in having very interesting and different events. We've had a comedian with Tourette syndrome. We've had a magician. We had a D4TS derby, which was video horse race thing. And we've had a trivia night. So we make it different. And as the next box says, make sure there's some value to the guests and value to you. It's a lot of work to do an event and you really wanna be sure that you're earning money from each event that you do. But also it's important that the guests get something out of it. We enjoy teaching them about Tourette syndrome, but also we usually have dinner and, and bar and, and fun entertainment, so value. As part of your event, it's important to try to get sponsorships and donations for things like auction items, uh, silent auction and raffle items, uh, corporate sponsors for things like the bar sponsor, the venue sponsor, and the food sponsor. Uh, you could do crowdfunding. You could partner with restaurants and retailers. We have partnered with restaurants several times where they have what we call a D4TS dining day. You go and eat that night, show your flyer, and then the restaurant will give the organization 20% of the uh, bill at no extra cost to the, to the diner. And we've done that with retailers as well for their purchases. You can have galas and shows and dinners. And then house parties is, is one that we've had success with where there's someone that's a great supporter of the organization and they are generous enough to open their home to have an event and they invite people that they know, 
charge a very small fee, and then you get to go, you get to speak and tell about the organization. And we even had uh, raffle prizes and silent auction, and we earned a lot of money that way. And it was a lot less stressful than a large gala, and it was very personal, so people enjoyed it. Our next hat is budget management. There's so many things to talk about with this, but let's go over a few. Um, I'm not gonna read everything on this page to you, but when you begin a nonprofit, there are a lot of expenses that you need to be ready for, from rent to your software, to different services and so forth, to paying for that solicitation registration I mentioned. So watch your budget and be aware of all of these expenses that you're going to run into. I wanted to talk about banking briefly under this budget part. When we started our organization, we went looking for a bank that had um, no minimum dollar amount, no minimum balance required. I interviewed about five banks, I remember. We found that uh, we wanted no monthly fees for our checking account and a, and a bank that allowed a reasonable number of transactions monthly. The bank that we ended up with was PNC and they satisfied all those requirements. So that's just a hint on what I felt was a great nonprofit uh, banking relationship. As sort of a secondary bank, you might have uh, relationships with PayPal or Eventbrite if you're going to have an event. We use PayPal for event registration and donations on our donation page. So we kind of have a second bank there uh, with PayPal. So just a couple notes about banking. And income sources. Most nonprofits will tell you that the largest uh, place that they get their most donations from is personal donations. And that is true for ourselves as well. But we did these pie charts for every year from 2015 to 2019 so far. And it's very interesting to look at them and compare. And it's important to know where your strongest income source is. And you can see, hopefully, the blue there is private individual donations. It's the largest on the left for 2018. And then the brown area is fundraisers. If you look at 2019, you can see that the orange section, which is grants, got very large and the brown section was smaller. So as Kelsey mentioned, we got the Rising Star Award, a $5,000 donation. So that made the grant section very large. Our personal uh, donations are still large in the blue. And then we had very few fundraisers in 2019, so it was smaller. But it's good to have this information as you think about the growth of your organization and where you're going next and where those funds are coming from. Next is growth management. And I wanted to talk about this because we started out as a small family foundation. We actually still are local, but with a national presence. When you think about growth, everyone thinks, I'm gonna start a nonprofit and it's gonna be worldwide and we're gonna have offices and chapters all over the place. And to that I say to you, think about why. Why are you thinking about growth and is there a good reason for it? Does what you supply right now satisfy the needs of your constituency and the people you serve? It's important to think about why before you have the, the big ideas about growth and are you ready? So does growth mean to you more board members so that you have more contacts? Does it mean you're going to grow and have more volunteers to have a better impact? Does growth just mean more awareness, more money? Does it mean you're going to add more programs? Like I said, we have scholarships and renewable, hopefully we're still working on that and camp and so forth. Does it mean growing is adding more programs and more partnerships? Perhaps you're looking for more partnerships uh, with corporations. So think about growth and your big why for that. Resources management. When we first began, it was very important for me to speak to other people who were running nonprofits. And as you get into the work world, I'm sure you'll begin to have a network of those if you're in the nonprofit realm. And I took great pleasure in having monthly lunches with friends of mine that run nonprofits and their executive directors and just picking their brain and asking them every question under the book. And I would come away with, oh, maybe try this funder, maybe try that person, and have you tried this event? So just for yourself and for your growth, learn from others uh, just by scheduling a lunch. You can also go to group meetings AFP stands for the Association of Fundraising Professionals. You can get a lot of ideas from that kind of a group and going to conferences. There's a certification for nonprofit. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. I think it's called Certified Nonprofit Professional, but you can find those and those kind of courses will teach you all kinds of things about nonprofits. Courses, seminars. I attend so many webinars. I get a lot of e-newsletters from different uh, nonprofit coaches and there are even nonprofit podcasts. So there's a lot of information out there. And of course, different associations. 
um, organizations that are resources for nonprofits, GuideStar is sort of a charity regulator. You register and it just helps give your organization credibility. They were recently, um, I don't know who they purchased, merged, I suppose, with a group called Candid. So that's really their new name. You can still find GuideStar, but you can look up any charity in GuideStar. And when you find them there, you know that they're a valid charity. Charity Navigator is very similar to GuideStar in that it uh, helps rank charities. And then Great Nonprofits, we're applying for that one right now. So that's another organization that just lists nonprofits so that you know that they're valid. We're a member of the Society for Nonprofit Organizations. They have benefits such as memberships to GrantStation and funding alerts, emails. There's the Association of Fundraising Professionals I mentioned, and there's so many local and national organizations. Here in Florida, we have one called Nonprofits First, where it's a membership organization and they provide webinars. I'm not sure if that's national or not. There are actually nonprofit chambers of commerce that you can find. And also SCORE, uh, this is a national organization of people who are leaders in business. It's called the Service Corps of Retired Executives. And I met with them twice when we formed the nonprofit to get ideas and boy, they were great as far as business ideas and things to do. And it's a free resource. You can schedule with your local SCORE office and get someone assigned to you. The last resource here are grant sources. I had mentioned Candid before. They also merged with Foundation Center at the same time. When we first started, Foundation Center is where I turned to find funder lists, like places where we could apply for grants. You can search their foundation directory online by keyword, uh, in our case, disability, youth, higher education. And then you can come up with the funders that fund that kind of uh, cause. And then in our case, I emailed it to myself and then we were able to follow up with those. So foundation directory online, there is a cost for that. You may be able to find it at your local library, but this is one of the best sources for finding uh, organizations that can provide grants. Also Grantspace, they have a learning, this is part of Foundation Center, Grantspace is actually a place where there's a lot of resources for learning about nonprofit. Some of that I believe you can find free online under Foundation Center and Candid. GrantStation is very similar to the Foundation Directory Online in that it's another place where you can find grants. And we have a membership to that through our membership in Society for Nonprofit Organizations, but they are very well researched and very much kept up to date. So GrantStation is another great place to find funders. This link that I put in here is called the 990 Finder. I mentioned the 990 as the uh, tax return of the nonprofit. If you go to this link, you can find an organization's 990 form online because it's all transparent public record. And you can find who they have funded before. Perhaps we might look for organizations such as did someone fund an autism organization or a multiple sclerosis organization or some organization with health, or did they fund an organization that had to do with higher education? You can find out who they have funded in the past year, because these are done annually, and you can find the dollar amount that they actually provided as their grant. So it helps you know what to ask for if you're approaching them for a grant. So this is a great, a great link. So those are the grant sources that we would recommend. And as I said, we use the uh, Grant Hub online as our grant tracking software. For, we have four grant writer volunteers, which I feel very lucky to have that. So it's a, it's a great help. So that's the end of our presentation. I'm gonna stop screen sharing now. And I hope that uh, there was some information that you didn't know about nonprofits there. And I'll turn it back over to Spencer or Rachel. Thank you so much, Diane and Kelsey. That was awesome. I definitely learned a ton of information that I didn't know before. And I think uh, with a lot of the members of SWAP, as we have had a, uh, a few other guest speakers, we're starting to see a lot of uh, common themes that people talk about and share uh, with their experiences and whatnot. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read off some questions, and I have one burning, so I'm going I'm to be mean and I'm going to ask mine first. Um, so I just wanted to know, uh, how do you go about securing a venue, supplies, and even possibly entertainment without spending so much money that it counteracts uh, any donations that you get for an event? Excellent question, because everything costs money, doesn't it, when you're getting ready to have an event? We actually have done it a couple of ways. Our very first event was in a bank lobby. So if you know someone that works in a very beautiful corporate building, you can ask them if the property management firm would allow you to have an event in their lobby. This was a marble lobby. It turned out to be a beautiful 
unusual event. So that was how we did our first event. After that, we partnered with our bank. I mentioned PNC. Um, we actually did a trivia night in one of their conference rooms. So that worked out well. So it's a lot of using the network and, and people that you know. But what we have landed on for our last large event is look for government buildings in your area. We have partnered with the Civic Center and it's been the most inexpensive venue and it's huge because they host all kinds of government uh, events. There's a large room, it, you can divide it into four, but it has screens that we can show our PowerPoint on, it has AV. Um, the deposit to hold that room is $250, which is not too bad at all. And then they do charge for staff uh, for the evening, which is very reasonable. And we usually rent it for six hours between teardown and so forth. And we um, can, I don't know the total that we can get out of there, maybe for $900 or something like that. So I would recommend seeing if there's any buildings like that, or again, who you know, and who's, who has a big room that you can use. Awesome, thank you. Um, Jackson, I believe had the first question, yes. Uh, I don't know if this was addressed earlier, but what does that application process look like? Jackson, feel free to unmute yourself if you wanna be a little bit more specific with your question too. Oh, I was just curious on like how someone would go about applying for the scholarship. Like what are like what are the like requirements? Like I know some S or some scholarships require like essays and um, kind of like a questionnaire. Um, like what is the scholarship application like what does it entail? Thank you for asking that. And we looked at a lot of uh, considerations when we decided to develop our application. And our requirements are one, that you have to have a diagnosis of Tourette's syndrome from your uh, neurologist or psychiatrist. Um, and in addition, we require a 2.5 GPA. We determined that that was, that was a good uh, range for GPA. Um, the things that we require for the actual scholarship are fairly extensive. I know you guys are, have been through all this before, but we require three letters of recommendation from academic, academic family, and work and we require your transcripts. We do require a college essay. We have a certain word count for, for that. We require a FAFSA, the um, federal aid document, and we require a video. And the reason we did this was because many organizations that have scholarships have the luxury of being able to sit down with you in a room and interview you and see if you're a good candidate for their scholarship, but we can't, and because we're nationwide, we require videos so that the candidate will produce a video and they'll make it unlisted on YouTube so that nobody can see it except those who have the link. And then we share that with our scholarship selection committee. Um, they're also required to give us data on academic, um, extracurricular activities. I think I got it all. Um, so, and work activities. So uh, quite an extensive application, but uh, it's because we really want to find people that have that X factor. Dylan would like to know, do you make merchandise like shirts, et cetera? And if so, do proceeds from sales of those items go back into fundraising for scholarships? Dylan, thank you for that question. And it's so fascinating because so many nonprofits um, are, are looking for something that they can use to sell to gain money for their programs. I, I attended a seminar once and they called it, what's your Girl Scout cookie? You know, so we're always thinking about that question. What, what's our Girl Scout cookie? What could we sell to provide money back? Uh, there's a charity that I've worked with on a PR basis, for instance, that sells golf balls so that then you buy a pack of golf balls and then you play it forward when whoever receives the golf balls, then they buy another pack of golf balls. So that is their Girl Scout cookie, so to speak. So we don't have one right now. We, we did t-shirts our very first year we did t-shirts for whoever helped us send children to summer camp. And, it, and the t-shirt said, I, I helped send a child with Tourette's syndrome to summer camp. So we did that one year. Uh, it wasn't a, a big popular seller, though we did sell them. But, um, you know, thanks for the idea. We're always thinking of that and how we can find something that could be good uh, to, to raise extra money. So that's always in our sights. Jamie would like to know, how much did you raise with your first crowdfunding campaign? Jamie, also a good question. We raised about, we, well, we had two parts. We had the event itself, 
and then we had the crowdfunding campaign online through Indiegogo. So for the event itself, we raised about $1,500. And for the crowdfunding uh, site itself, we raised about $1,800. So that gave us uh, close to $3,000, a little over in our pockets to get things going. So I had actually taken a course on crowdfunding prior to doing the campaign, and it was very in-depth. I found it online. I would highly recommend it if they're still doing it. And it talked about all the things you need to be prepared, being able to share it with media and so forth. So we did all of those efforts. And uh, I think for an organization fresh out of the gate, we were pretty happy with that first step. Daniela would like to know, how do you determine the profit you keep to your household versus what goes back into the nonprofit? Household. I'm not sure I understand the question and I'll just answer that this way. We are, go ahead. Yeah, I was just kind of um, wondering because earlier you had mentioned, um, you know, how obviously profit is coming from people who support, um, you know, what you guys are doing, support the purpose. And so my question, and this is a question that I've kind of had that's been unclear throughout all of my nonprofit knowledge is, um, how do you sustain, like, how do you determine how you can sustain yourself when you are in a nonprofit and that money continues to just go back into the nonprofit, the organization? Okay, right. Does that make right. more sense? Yes, now, now I understand. Um, we are, as Kelsey had mentioned, an all-volunteer uh, all organization. None of us take salaries. We currently do this out of the love for doing it. Um, we're always looking at how can we grow enough to sustain this, to pay salaries so that we can, uh, you know, keep Kelsey on board or keep myself on board and be able to stop other jobs, for instance. We have not reached that point yet. We're at our five-year mark and we're still putting all of the funding back into the organization. Um, so we are so far not sustaining our own lifestyle through the nonprofit syndrome as our mission. I feel like it's a small niche. We are working on uh, that, but if your family is affected by Tourette syndrome, I think you know it's a great supporter, but we don't, we don't support you know, puppies and, and hungry children. So I think that that gives you the opportunity to grow larger, but because of our small niche right now, we have not achieved the, the self-sustaining mode. And uh, thank you for that question. Gotcha. Yes, thank you. Great question. Um, Jamie would like to know, how have you adapted your fundraising events changed due to COVID? Thank you, Jamie, for that question. We have experienced definitely an impact because of COVID. The first thing I'll mention is our applications are always due April 15. And because of COVID, students were not able to get their transcripts from their schools. They weren't able to reach uh, professors to get letters of recommendation. So first, before the events, I'll mention an accommodation that we did was we opened a second round of scholarship applications to accommodate students. So what we did, we've never done this before. Usually it uh, closes April 15th and we award in June. So we took kids for that, but the kids that were not able to supply all the parts, we kept all their information. And on June 1st, we opened up a round two that's going to close September 30th. And then those funds are going to be awarded in November in time for the January semester. So that's one accommodation we did because of COVID to help out the students to be able to get us their information. As far as events, it's definitely impacted our events. We had, we always have something during Tourette Syndrome Awareness Month. This is actually Tourette Syndrome Awareness Month between May 15 and June 15 every year. It's kind of an odd month, but that's when they have the month. So we always have our, what we call our summer camp paint party during this time. It's usually the first week of June. And that raises money for our summer camp sponsorships. And we have been unable to do that. So we are hoping to have that kind of an event in the fall. We have looked at uh, the possibility of online events. We haven't done any, any the first half of this year. And then all of a sudden it was scholarship time and we became wrapped up with those evaluations and so forth. We're looking into the paint party for the fall. And we may also have a, um, we have a relationship with Total Wine and we may have a wine tasting event there at their store uh, in a couple of cities here. 
but this year has been a very quiet year as far as events. Last year was quiet because we had some, uh, we had a death in the family, so that kind of slowed things down. But uh, this year, yes, COVID has definitely impacted that. Um, we will probably gear up more toward August and September, figuring out how to uh, how to begin soliciting for more money. One of our big campaigns also every year is Giving Tuesday. You might have heard that they had one of those uh, this past June, partway through the year, but typically that's the first Tuesday after Thanksgiving. So that's a big online fundraising for us, and that should be not impacted by COVID-19, we hope. So yes, it's been a little bit of a challenge. Thank you for that question. Jamie would also like to know if you have a link to the crowdfunding source that you could share with us. I don't have the link at my fingertips, but if you search Indiegogo, I-N-D-I-E-G-O-G-O, -G -O, probably .com or .org, that's the crowdfunding campaign setup we went with. Kickstarter is one that's good for brand new products, so we didn't feel like that was as great a match as Indiegogo. Um, some people use GoFundMe. Those are more personal, like help me go to school or help me pay for vet bills. So I, I do recommend Indiegogo, Indiegogo. They were easy to work with. I was meaning the, the course you said you took. Oh, may I supply that to Rachel afterwards? That would be fantastic. Thank you. I'd be happy to do that. Yes. Thank you. I am very interested in that as well, actually. And yes, Rachel would like to know when it comes to your partnerships with businesses and retailers where you set up an evening or day and get 20% of sales, what is your process for approaching these businesses? When do you make the ask and do you ever, and do they ever approach you? Excuse me. Great question. And the answer is yes, they have approached us. One retailer that we worked with twice and then they've approached us again have you ever heard of Kendra Scott Jewelry? The retailer Kendra Scott is a very, very philanthropic retailer. And we, when we very first started, we had a big gala. They donated some jewelry for an event. So that started the relationship. And then they contacted us and said, how about having an event in our store? And what they do is for one day, for three hours, anyone who comes into the store, when they purchase, 20% of their purchase comes to the charity. And then they will also give a free piece of jewelry as a raffle while everybody's there. So it was a blast. They supplied um, refreshments and so forth. So we did that last October. We did it again this February because of their invitation. And now they've invited us to try it online. Back to your question, Jamie. Um, trying it online for two days to see if people will buy online and then they will give us 20%. So they're a fantastic partner for us corporately. And of course, uh, all of the social media promotion we do, we send out letters and social media to tell people, come shop, come shop, and, and we're constantly doing those. Um, as, for, as far as the restaurants, we have had good luck with a lot of restaurants. We've been to Chili's a few times. Um, they, that is a matter of walking in, uh, asking to speak to the manager, telling them that you're a nonprofit and saying, would you do this for us? And that's how we've done it, is just walk in and ask them. Now, if someone knows a restaurateur, that helps. We, we didn't know one personally from church, for instance, and he did it for us. And then again, we make up the flyer or perhaps the restaurant gives us the flyer. Chili's created a flyer for us and then people bring their flyer in. But in the restaurant case, and I would say any retailer as well, it's a, it's a matter of you know making your decision and walking in. And another hint to that is walk in with two of you. Take a board member, take a volunteer. So there's two of you walking in. I think it's a little easier than just walking in by yourself. And uh, we found that that works for us, but it has been, it's been pretty productive. Awesome, thank you. Megan would like to know, do you have any methods of volunteer appreciation that you have seen significantly impact your volunteer uh, retention slash return rate? Thank you for caring about our volunteers, Megan. When we have a volunteer and we have interviewed them and so forth, on their first day when they come in, I try to have something waiting for them on their desk, like a little plant. I've given little plants and things like that to tell them that we're so glad that they're there. Um, we, I also thank them profusely, but um, it's, uh, and actually another thing we've done, we've had many, many college students the, and college students are great. You guys are great because you're so on top of technology and, and social media. It helps me out a lot. We appreciate it. And we have uh, given monetary appreciation when someone graduates at least three times for some of our students. And uh, I had one girl, 
uh, I had, we had given her a, a thank you gift and she was in tears and she's like, this was supposed to be volunteer. I'm like, I know it was supposed to be volunteer, but we so appreciate it. So we do try to appreciate them. And uh, I, I'm also very flexible with scheduling. Things come up, you're studying for a test and so forth. And so I think that they appreciate that I, I, I move my schedule with them as long as we're on the same page and they communicate well with me. We try to accommodate that. Thank you. Um, our final question for the evening is actually from myself, and this is just a pretty general nonprofit uh, question, but I was just curious if uh, the amount of hours that are logged in by volunteers affect uh, your tax exemption. They do not, okay. to my knowledge, and the way I'm going to answer that is, oh, affect your tax exempt exemption. No, no, it does not. Um, you apply for the 1023, you get your determination letter, and then when you turn in your application for sales tax exemption, they're not asking how many volunteer hours there are. No. Mm -mm. Do, do you have to pay a tax on the volunteers themselves? No. Okay. There's no kind of, they're all volunteer, there's no kind of employment tax of any kind. Perfect. Okay. In yeah. fact, we're, um, you know, as far as the uh, IRS and turning in uh, tax, you know, the 990, there's several different forms of that. There's a 990 EZ, there's the extensive 990, um, and also we're tax exempt and, and exempt from solicitation registration in many states. Uh, so we're able to turn in the 990 in postcard. That's based on how much uh, money you earn every year and so forth. So there's a lot of different, different levels of uh, turning in that 990 as well. Gotcha. Well, thank you. That definitely answers my question. Um, that seems to be everything for the night. Thank you so much again, Diane and Kelsey. If everyone could give the, our guest speakers another round of applause, please. That was excellent. Thank you so much. And I loved all the questions from you guys. I can tell you're really thinking. Your gears are turning. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Of course. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. All right. I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic over to Megan or Jamie, if they had any uh, last comments for us. Um, so I'll take it, as you probably heard Jamie say, but um, I just completely lost my train of thought. I wanted to say one more thank you. I just really enjoyed having you guys speak tonight. Um, I have to say from like a mother-daughter duo, it's really awesome to see another mother-daughter out there um, working on a nonprofit together and seeing that like, su succeeding just is very helpful for me. Um, for the rest of the meeting tonight specifically, I'll that I, wait one second. Yes. Can I say one thing before you go into that? Yes, Jamie's gonna say one more thing. <laughs> you guys thought you'd keep me silent. Um, I just wanna thank you for when you talked about SWOT analysis and everybody's gonna roll their eyes, but anybody who's had a class with me, I always make them do a SWOT analysis because I tell them that's the way to keep an organization sustainable in 21st century. So I was so excited that you said that. And then Dylan is also um, related to me and he really wants to know how Kelsey picked that background. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> well, first of all, it's teal. So it's one of our colors. Um, so that's why I picked it. And then second of all, it was just one of the options on the background for Zoom. <laughs> but thanks, Dylan. <laughs> Okay, so just for the rest of the end of the meeting, anyone who's new here tonight and wants to know more about SWAP or being a part of SWAP next year since this is our last meeting, um, even if you're graduating and you're becoming alumni, you can leave your email in the chat box and we can add it to our communication list. Uh, we'd like to keep you involved if you would like to do so. Uh, I would ask that anyone who's going to be on leadership next year stick around just for a couple minutes after the meeting because I just want to talk a little about a couple things for summer. But other than that, I'd just like to say thank you to our speakers again and say thank you all for who attended and that I hope you guys have a good night and a good summer and that we will look forward to the return in fall. Thank you all. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Have a good night, everyone. Bye.